Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to everyone attending this 50th anniversary talk for the Bashara Trust. My name is Hugh Tolmash, and I was chairman of the Bashara Trust some years ago. And perhaps I might say here a very quick word about the Trust. The Bashara Trust is an educational charity founded in the United Kingdom 50 years ago. It was set up to provide the place and the space for people to discover a balanced integration of spiritual and material values within themselves. I personally believe that this is essential and that we should live our lives with full respect for both aspects. The Trust provides courses based on the perspective of the unity of existence, which underlies the great religious and wisdom traditions across the world. Of course, you can access the website bashara.org for more information if you wish. All who have registered, which is between three and 400 people, by the way, from 24 different countries, will be sent a link to the recording in due course. Thank you. Right, I think we can now start. Your Royal Highness. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I take the opportunity of thanking you for your kind welcome. Thank you. It's with the greatest pleasure that we welcome you today and very much appreciate your time in talking on the question Unity in Humanity, where two hands meet. I will not take up too much time introducing you, if you don't mind, as we would like to have as much time hearing from you, rather than spending too much time about you, much of which can be downloaded from the internet and from the short introduction with everybody on the Eventbrite invitation. However, I would just like to say that we are privileged to listen to someone who has dedicated his life to peace and humanity over several decades. Very actively, you have started so many initiatives and using reason and understanding to bring about change. So may I hand over to you, sir, to talk on the subject of unity in humanity, where two hands meet. As your humble servant, I would like to say to all of you participating and um, monitoring this uh, exchange, uh, how privileged I feel that this may be a continuum of conversations that I have had the privilege of um, holding with friends from all over the world. Only a little while ago, I was looking at the work of Sayyid Hussein Nasr, whom I'm sure is well known to all of you, and uh, I, remembering that one can cite the regular meetings organized by the Vatican, the World Council of Churches, and indeed most recently in St. George's House, Windsor, which was instigated by initially Prince Philip, uh, our late departed uh, friend and uh, sometime leader in these discussions, and uh, later on Evelyn Rothschild. So we had a, a trilogue which I think has uh, uh, echoed echoes in many parts of the world. For example, the Center for the Study of Islam and Christian Muslim Relations at Selly Oaks in Birmingham, uh, devoted to Muslim Christian understanding, as indeed in Hartford, Georgetown, in the United States, Bellament University and Lebanon. So I would say that uh, I do not feel lonely in the sense that uh, these dialogues exist, but I do feel lonely in the sense that in the post-COVID period, I think that loneliness has become an extremely uh, difficult factor of all our lives. Uh, here I would like to cite the work of the medical doctor and psychologist Evelyn Linder, who uh, founded the University of Dignity along with Columbia University and has met in over uh, 50 countries in the world with those of us who believe in forging our humanitarian uh, concept of um, order uh, in uh, the decades ahead. 
I am privileged to have worked with the International Commission for Humanitarian uh, Issues, an international humanitarian order was what the Secretary General of the time in the 1980s charged this group with. David Owen in this country is probably the only survivor of that particular exercise. And it is interesting today that more than ever before, it seems to me that we are in need of guidelines for a humanitarian law of peace, or dare I say, for a humanitarian approach to the resolution of the basic issue. Can we talk to each other or can we not? Is the noble art of conversation dead or has it been taken over by compulsion and conversion? As you know, the concept of uh, the suffering imposed by the pandemic is a, a, a fact in terms of the three challenges that we faced when we proposed this humanitarian order. Man against man, as we see in the wars currently uh, churning our very existence and our very psyche, and uh, uh, referring in the most cruel terms to the weakest in our uh, society, the marginalized and, and, and the humbled uh, by war. War in itself is the most pollutant uh, factor in our very existence and the consequences of previous wars, particularly in my region where we've had a war practically every 10 years, I say with great uh, horror and uh, uh, I, I don't know whether I'm making sense to those of you who are listening, but in the words of Linda, Corona is an opportunity in the midst of suffering. So I'll go back to man against man-made disasters, if I may. As the world, she says, watches the heartbreaking Corona virus pandemic unfold, we are still full of hope. The coronavirus virus pandemic as an, as, is an opportunity for an exponential change of heart so that global unity in respect to our local diversities becomes possible. Well, I don't know if we have to wait for a new Eleanor Roosevelt moment when it finally comes, if it comes where we can uh, address anew the Universal Declaration of Human Vulnerability. Uh, we've heard a lot about the right to respect, uh, forgive me, the right to protect, but I think it, today it is more a question of the right to respect uh, the uh, context in which I speak uh, should be ready to answer the following question together. How must we humankind arrange our affairs on this planet so that dignified life will be possible in the long term. Well, I'm very sure that most people on Earth would like to see human dignity as an absolute and a natural right for everyone. I'm not sure, however, that all peoples and nations have the same understanding of the meaning of dignity in the sphere of international politics. I prefer policies to politics because policies are enduring in the medium and long term to politics which are affected in so much arbitrariness and short termism. And of course, in the related issues of economy, environment, and now most importantly, refugees. There are over 100 million refugees in the world, according to Filippo Grande the other day speaking in uh, Shanghai and peace as well as conflict resolution. Preventing a conflict seems to be rather difficult in our playbook, although there's a playbook of those politicians who uh, hold sway over all of us. And I remember that in 1994, some of us suggested after the Casablanca summit meeting of the Middle East North Africa grouping, in fact, I believe uh, Shimon Perez and myself met in Brussels, at the EU, and we suggested, why don't you consider 24 countries, from Morocco to Turkey inclusively, where we could encourage the will to stay of all those boat people, as we came to know them, who have turned large parts of the Mediterranean into a sea of death. 
how can we promote an encounter in the Mediterranean other than with human dignity? Human dignity in Arabic is karama, which has its roots in karam, generosity. And all I expected was the intellectual generosity of the EU to say, well, give us a few months to study the concept which is basically preventive diplomacy, doing something about encouraging their will to stay. Nothing happened, and a few years later, we all felt the effects of 9-11, where people from my country were killed, Christians and Muslims, in the Twin Tower tragedy. And a few months after that, the president of the United States at that time decided to create homeland security, so giving the impression and the 35 billion that would have been allocated to keeping refugees in the southern littoral of the Mediterranean, 24 countries did not receive one penny of the 35 billion that we have projected, whereas Homeland Security cost with, this, with one signature $35 billion. Today, of course, the billions of dollars going into weaponry, as indeed to oil in the past, have made it absolutely impossible to uh, talk about the primacy of human consideration and human investment over the internet of things. I have personally believed all my life, particularly since I heard this word internet, I used to talk about interconnectivity and cultural affinity. I believe in internet rather than internet, and certainly not the internet of things, but I don't quite understand what things means. Uh, and sadly, this has not been able, not been possible to realize. An internet, a cultural internet, where giving of yourself intellectual generosity, which is fundamentally a social concept, and the highly charged emotional frame framework for the individual to determine, determine the worthiness of his or her life, none, none of this has been possible. I believe that we are governed by extremes on all sides and in all nationalities and religions. And having served the World Conference for Religions and Peace for six years, I recognize that uh, we have much in common but at the same time, I would like to suggest that while universal dignity rests on an ex on acceptance of difference, on the one hand, all people belong to a single community. On the other hand, as in the Quran, uh, 49, 13, it, it is noted that the division of the world into nations and tribes was also intended as God's will so that you may know one another, not that you may despise each other. To know is to love, but at the same time, how many peoples in the Balkans knew each other well enough, or in the Near East, and yet, despite everything, have made it very clear that they have no love for each other when it comes to resorting to arms and brutality in the context of what I call the cultivation of hatred. I believe books have been written on this subject, but I would like to add that human dignity depends on a healthy ecosystem. And along with Evelyn Lindner, I do believe that the alternatives to a portal whereby we broaden our minds after the pandemic of uh, the last few years and talk of an opportunity to put things right with the new humanitarian order, a law of peace, and the new context of the human generosity, or what Tony Orr but Oxford calls effective altruism. If this is not possible, I think we are going to see that regional commons, creative commons that exist across lines, drawn on maps, cannot be sustained. And it requires, I believe, thinking beyond the traditional silos of the Ministry of this and the Ministry of that, water, energy, food, security, as single items, to talking in clusters, a wifi, if you will, water, energy, food, and environment. And I would like at this point to 
point out that if we do not preserve the ecosphere, if we do not preserve the sociosphere, can we at least preserve the cogitosphere, the ability to think for ourselves and to exercise wisdom rather than cleverness? In Reconstructing Lives, Victims of War in the Middle East, Vanya Kovacic acknowledges that war and its physical, economic, psychological, social, and symbolic types of violence, Vanya works monitoring the work of Médecins Sans Frontières, and she says that the impacts of these disasters can only be grasped through the individual's experience. Not only does it offer an insight into the daily reality of patients during and after rehabilitation, but it seeks to develop a new way to perceive, respect, and involve them in their journey to recovery, humanizing the process. So it's not we who count in all this conversation. It is the millions of people who expect that there might, might just be a glimmer of cogens in, in the future to avert cogitos side, as indeed we seem to be heading towards eco side and socio side. As for making peace, the confluence of spiritual awareness and practical engagement, I would ask, as Wilfred Cantwell Smith once did, the following question. If the only way to transcend the limited loyalties of our fragmented society is through a transcendence that is greater and more serious, not one that is less, how do we address those who maintain that only religious faith is capable of providing such transcendence, of engendering and sustaining that larger vision without which a new world community will never come into being? Wilfred Cantwell Smith in his time said he did not know whether they are right. And I must say, I begin to ponder this question. Perhaps sufficient to our task is the conviction that religious faith can be a force, if not the only one, germane to this task. At the very least, those who speak in the name of religion must not make the task more difficult than it is. Although our value structures are not identical simulacra or blueprints of each other, in fact, I don't believe that the simulacra can be taken from one region of the world, one culture to another, and implemented in uh, full detail, copy for copy, as they say. But they are sufficiently similar for the fulfillment of what is expected of us in our mutual interaction, out and across to each other in empathy and even compassion. Islam is no monolith now. It never has been. Muslim societies and expressions of faith have undergone centuries of change. I believe the same can be said of other faith groups. Gnosticism, or any of various related philosophical and religious movements, were prominent in the Greco-Roman world in the early Christian era, particularly the second century, Gnostic, relating to knowledge, especially mystical or esoteric knowledge of spiritual things, developed into the Greek Gnosticos, knowing good, knowing, good at knowing, and able to discern. And I believe that this knowing in this age of internet and social media requires evidence-based proposal writing. We are at wit's end with being bombarded every day by messages from different quarters of the world and different interest groups. And I think that this makes it almost impossible to focus our spiritual values in today's world, to reflect on education of the heart, St. Augustine says we like to love, but we also like others to love us, quite simply, because we love truths. The literature of Sufism and all the teachings and Gnostic currents are not devoid of love. 
is the most important manifestation of peace whether peace is internal, as the wayfarer, Salik in Arabic, experiences, experiences peace on his path, or external as he does in his behavior, or to his behavior. I almost wanted to greet you as fellow wanderers, wanderers after truth. But do we read these writings and choose not to take them to heart, or is it more likely that we simply don't understand them? Is their production and their manifestation insufficient to establish a common humanity? I would like to ask my dear friends in the, this wonderful audience that if Ibn Arabi saw truth with his heart and then through his contemplations and lived values, he developed a doctrine of theology, mysticism, and metaphysics contained in his book, The Meccan Revelations. Al-Ghazali's journey began with his mind and his doubts about the logic of truths. But does this make these two pillars of thought any less significant, or do they reflect, in fact, the, the paradigm or the mindset of uh, inquisitive minds that should not be regarded unhealthy other than by doctrinaire regimens and regimes. In these difficult times, there are many threats to coexistence, to freedom, to personhood. As Rowan Williams says in his remarkable book, Looking East in Winter, defining Eastern Christianity, and their basic tenets of personhood, which I have chosen to translate into Arabic as al adamiya which is the human content of the human being, Adamic, if you will, and liberty. Yet wars, sectarianisms, conflicts, epidemics, environmental crises, all of which undermine our progress towards the moral and spiritual values that constitute the principle of human dignity and make us human witness possibly what the Sufi traditions suggest in an era long past the age of the death of hearts. Or in Persian, what is known as the murtadil, the blind, wanton killing of innocents all over the world because people are dead of heart. I don't want to ponder these issues for too long, but would far rather ponder them in conjunction with answering your questions. And I can see from the questions popping up in front of me that we already have a wealth of interest in this conversation. So I am privileged and humbled by your participation. I'll just finish or conclude my opening remarks by saying, what do we most appreciate in the other? We appreciate the ability and willingness where such manifestations have been forthcoming to reach out to each other in empathy, friendship, and solidarity, quite beyond our immediate circles of identity, in a manner that respects our diversities and differences. We appreciate the fact that although we hold our respective doctrines and creeds to be the truth for us, we have confidence that God's love and compassion for his children is such that he alone has the prerogative to judge people by their piety, good works, and sincerity of belief in the value systems which they hold to be true. In 1999, I worked in the company of Rabbi René Sirat of France, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, as he then was, then Pope Benedict, through the foundation of interreligious and intercultural research and dialogue to increase harmony among followers of the world's three main monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. 
To achieve this end, the foundation published all three holy books, the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and the Holy Quran in their original languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Arabic. Secondly, and lastly, what do we regard as the greatest problem in the other? What we all find disconcerting among less tolerant and enlightened members of our respective faiths is the tendency towards religious, cultural, and civilizational self-righteousness. In fact, the very word tolerance I find very difficult to accept. I don't want to be tolerated. I don't want to tolerate you or nor would you want to be tolerated by me. So maybe what we have to search for is a way of stepping out of attempts to claim monopolies on virtue. Our real success is to avoid references to divinely or ordained superiority and attempts to pass off one's historical suffering as being more sacred and unique than anyone else's. The ugly manifestation of such subhumanizing attitudes sometimes crystallize in a manner that comes to represent the very direction of nation states, such as the formerly apartheid South Africa, technically a democracy, but in actual fact, an ethnocracy. I would like to continue with you to explore many things, the place of religion in education within society, and many other issues, but I would like to return to our moderator, to you, Hugh, and to thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much. You've touched on so many issues and have highlighted some of the work that good people are doing to find ways through this. Uh, and your talk is frankly very timely. You know, the future does look quite bleak at the moment. Um, and the problems of the world do seem to be more and more extreme. We've got a few questions coming in and uh, I'll ask uh, Stephen and Elizabeth who are sorting through them so perhaps I could go straight to the first question, which comes in two or three different forms um, uh, to do with what is the best way to foster a healthy, optimistic outlook. But this puts it quite well. You have championed a vision of good citizenship. How would you encourage a young person to have hope in a world facing war, climate change, etc.? And would you commend any practical steps to that young person? Well, I would like to speak of a code of conduct, which is a product of uh, decades of hard work. And I have tried to summarize this code of conduct, which I hope a young person uh, participating in society as a stakeholder, custodian, Mustakhlaf, as we would say in Arabic and on, on this earth. Someone who is deeply concerned over water issues, and we are the second, as the World Bank has finally decided to uh, recognize us, water thirsty country, that is my country, Jordan, in the world. A citizen in a water thirsty country is called a water citizen. And I wonder whether the definition of worthiness is how much you make in terms of GDP or whether or not you can be encouraged in your educational process as in conflicts up and down what I call the Eurasian divide from the Baltics all the way to the Black Sea and then down to the Arabian Sea, whether you can be encouraged to begin with commonalities. So often we are told that we are divided into Sunni and Shia. And may I suggest that looking at the conflict between the churches today, with all due respect and without any presumption, it does come to my mind that after all, Christianity is a whole, Islam is a whole, Judaism is a whole, but why do the divisions of the present day mean so much. 
And I would assume that, as in the Code of Conduct, without emphasizing the association between theology and practicality, without beginning with commonality, our human commonality, without taking into account the different enlightenment traditions, what the French would call la tradition des lumières, without embracing, as I mentioned earlier, the principle of no coercion, it is impossible to up uphold the right to proclaim anything, least of all one's own religion. So can we reconsider the content of education as one of the consequences of war? I remember Sidney Bailey, the great Quaker, used to speak of, remember the consequences of war. Remember how wars end, he said. He wrote three magisterial books on the subject of how do wars end. Well, they end by reconsidering the content of education and ensuring a free, a free flow of evidence-based information. Lastly, can we be courageous in looking afresh at firstly our own and secondly each other's text, heritage and history. What a young person has to pass an exam or matriculate with may be a syllabus, but developing a framework for disagreement between people young or old is a, an art. And that's why I describe, in the words of uh, my tutor at Oxford in the 60s, Professor Theodore Zeldin, the importance of promoting the noble art of conversation. It is an art and not a science. Of course, in science, whenever it is scientific cooperation, diplomatically, it's accepted transcending uh, nationalities and uh, different identities. But if we are to accept responsibility for words and actions at all levels, then I think this is what I would hope the future young generations would take into consideration. And lastly, recognizing the economic or the socioeconomic impact of our plans and programs in the context of humanizing the stats. We look at figures and numerals and galore, but do we understand who the person behind all of this is? As this wonderful lady from the Médecins Sans Frontières said, who is this patient lying in front of me? Syrian, Iraqi, Yemeni, Palestinian, Libyan, and why is he here? And in Latin, they say, veres shere es per causa shere. To know the truth is through knowing the causes of the truth. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a number of questions, and I'm not quite sure how to take this uh, in which order. Uh, I would like to, because you have mentioned it so often, and I think this is quite a short question, but in education, do you think that we concentrate too much on educating the mind and not enough on educating the heart? This has come into a number of questions, uh, and also you have already mentioned about it before. The literary tradition of the Chinese golden rule, which we've spoken of many times, appears to originate in the writings of Confucius 551 to 479 BCE. The most ancient source for the golden rule is the Analects of Confucius. And I would like to ask in the words of the Analects, is there one word which can serve as the guiding principle for conduct through one's life? To which Confucius says, it is the word altruism, Chu in Chinese, do not do to others what you do not want them to do to you. And I've tried with my participants in the conference on uh, world's religions for peace to ask the following questions. And maybe your listeners, our dear listeners would like to comment, if I were to ask you, 
which origin does the following terminology derivate, derivate from? Hurt not others in ways, in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. The origin to that is Buddhism. As thou deemest thyself, so deem others, then shalt thou become a partner in heaven. Sikhism, Confucianism, surely it is the maxim of loving kindness. Do not unto others that you would not have them do unto you. In terms of Islam, no one of you is a believer until he desires from his brother that which he desires for himself. What is hateful to you, do not do to others. That is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. Judaism. I could go on to mention the high faith, Gnosticism, Hinduism, Native American, Shintoism, and many others. But I would like to make the point that unless we learn how to teach by analogy, to learn by analogy, narratival education is not a, 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 a method of uh, positioning ourselves in a world debate. Uh, a complicated question. Listening to you, my humble question or suggestion is, do you not think that unless all of what you have said and are suggesting could not be achieved unless we include all this in our mainstream educational institutional systems? Otherwise, the divide between the moral philosophical thinking and the material praxis cannot be patched, in my humble opinion. I, I fully agree that the centrality of uh, this construct is something that should be taken extremely seriously, but I would just like to point out, as Sayyid Hussein Nasser says uh, so brilliantly in his expose, freedom of worship involves the question of conversion and apostasy. Christian missionaries often criticize Muslims, Muslims for branding a Muslim who converts to Christianity as an apostate, a murtad, whose punishment is death according to the dictates of Sharia. First of all, I would say, let it be said that if such a promulgation has been carried out strictly historically, and especially in modern, modern times, there would not have been all those Pakistani, Bangladeshi, or African Christians of Islamic origin who are presently living as Christians in the Islamic world. And in that context, I would also like to mention in terms of plurality, the rather interesting remarks of uh, Matthew Teller in his book, The Nine Quarters of Jerusalem. Of course, there are four quarters to a whole, but the nine quarters means that in each neighborhood, there is someone living in someone else's neighborhood. And I would like to suggest that this concept of plurality, respect for the other, intra-independence, is not what the national curriculum usually presents. The national curriculum presents what is right for me is right for everyone. One size fits all. So I would like to suggest that maybe in a practical manner that ensuring school worship is not solely exclusive. Organizing exchange programs is so regenerating that they have to be constructed many yesterdays ago. I don't know if Teze still exists in, in France, but that is an example. Establishing Interfaith Week, examining teacher training curricula, developing programs for the media. I helped to establish One World Broadcasting Trust many years ago, 
and we gave a prize to the achievers in many different countries on many different issues. But today the media tends to look at the sensational and linking through the media with other relevant bodies is not a service that is easily undertaken, especially in this country with the diminishing resources of the British Council. I happen to be patron of the British Council for Research in the Levant, and I say this with a heavy heart. Establishing an international foundation award for good practice. And lastly, building a database of what already exists. I have another question for you, sir. There are many divergent beliefs, and indeed you're involved with many of many interfaith organizations. Have you found a place where these divergences can meet? It's beyond conflict. Embracing our differences as the path to peace is obviously an ultimate place we all want to land. But in the times of uncertainty in which we live, there is enormous strength to be gained by holding fast to our core values and making them foundational principles that inform our work. For example, in my country, we have cooperation with the Heinrich Heine University in Germany. And uh, our graduates, German and Jordanian, Palestinian, and many other countries who go to Heinrich Heine, graduate with a worldview in different languages. And I believe that this kind of education is essential, as I said earlier, in avoiding self-righteousness and arrogance. It is a humbling experience to have had 40 postgraduate students from uh, the experiment of FER, the Foundation for Intercultural Dialogue. Postgraduate students who spent the best part of the year studying the traditions of another. And we didn't decide who that other should be. It was up to them whether they chose an American Indian, or someone from the Far East or the Far West. In fact, as far as we are concerned, we're not the Middle East at all. In Japan and China, we are regarded as the Middle West. So this directional view is rather out of date. And I think it holds especially true in terms of our faiths. When I went to a synagogue in Sao Paulo, I was received with more intimacy than I would have been received possibly in a synagogue or in a more politicized context, because it, it was the Easterners who left Turkey after the First World War and the drought and famine faced in our part of the world and got on that boat and said, we want America. America, whether it was North or South, they wouldn't, didn't know. And they arrived all over the Americas. And we need to revise this relink, especially now with the Zoom. In Arabic, we have a word, Luzum, which means necessity. So it is Zoom out of necessity, a Zoom and the Luzum. But why don't we make these distance shortening experiences more effective in developing an understanding of the clusters of the social impact of law on society, for example, in terms of the multi-deprivation index, which looks at all aspects of deprivation and not just at hunger per se, which may differ in its circumstances from one country to another in terms of the price of commodities, etc. Why don't we look at the norms of law and the identities that we are addressing in remembering that each one of us 
holds within us a communal history. And when will that communal history be transferred with the travel of migrants to different parts of the world? I think the issue of identity has taken a lot of buffeting over the years. And I just want to point out that in terms of identity, the crafting of the universal ethic as a basis for a new international humanitarian order is essential, as Paul Eakins pointed out in his new world order at the beginning of this 21st century. Few can deny that a global crisis uh, has loomed, is peaking, and all of us in our indecision cannot recognize what it is we're going to do other than sending weapons and helping with whatever we can, hand to mouth, reorganizing of our humanitarian effort. But the silos continue. The individual expenditures continue. The lack of definition of the human identity continues. And I believe that so the sovereign nation state is the ultimately legitimate form of political authority. And when that extends to sovereign legitimate over religion, you have nationally religious states. And I personally don't believe that religion and nationality are uh, synonyms. So I would hope that I have not offended anyone but I think the disastrous results for citizens, especially given that many national governments have been irresponsible in the conduct of their affairs, is something that we should be aware of, all of us, if we are to be contributing human beings. All right. Thank you. Um, quite a, a quick question here, I hope, for you, sir. Uh, what is the key progress that you have seen humanity make in the last 50 years? In 1945, as I mentioned earlier, of course, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt took that wonderful initiative in terms of the Bill of Human Rights. And I would like to say that in terms of her humanitarian approach, I am privileged to mention that my late mother-in-law, as the only Muslim woman, the only Muslim participating in that exercise, attempted to promote the concept of genocide. Today we hear the concept of genocide being used in many different contexts. Yet in 1945, during that Nuremberg trial, it was Professor Lotterpracht who on the one side called for crimes against humanity to be recognized. And on the other side, Professor Lemkin, who my late mother-in-law, Begum Ikramullah, knew well, who attempted to promote the concept of genocide. This was not possible unless you were trying to define the erasing of the identity of an entire population. And it was not acceptable at that time to the United States. More recently, we've heard the United States referring to the concept of gen genocide textually, but not legally. The accounting for people's uh, breaking of the law, morally, legally, ethically, has resulted in the creation of international courts and international criminal courts. But I want to ask myself in trying to answer your question about what achievements over the last decades since World War II, I would like to suggest 
as in the words of Suha Taji Faruqi, when she participated merely in these continuous attempts at developing cooperation between the religious definitions that we refer to in terms of global responsibility. We refer to the responsibilities of the Confucians, the Confucians in Southeast Asia. We refer to Hans Kuhn. If you recall, my dear friend at Tübingen University, when he wrote Global Responsibility in Search of a New World Ethic, which appeared during the early part of the last decade, the last decades, at the end of 1988, took so long in coming, the World Council of Churches expressed a commitment to lay the foundation of the new global ethic of collaboration with other religions. So 1945 to 1988, until they finally got it together, so to speak, to make a statement. Kuhn developed this further in the context of the Declaration Towards a Global Ethic, signed in September 1993 by some 200 delegates attending the meeting of the Parliament of World's Religion in Chicago. And I would like to suggest to you that whether or not one agrees with Kuhn Kuhn's optimistic assumptions there is a clear basis for arguing that religious perspectives do possess the potential to provide important resources toward the creation of a new world ethic. You go to a place of worship to worship, but do you go there to be inspired? Is religious leadership educationally giving us the necessary every Friday in a mosque inspiration? which goes beyond the word. And I would like to suggest that the divisions, the conflict, the violence, and the intolerance notwithstanding everything we have done in the past decade since World War II have continued. As I said to you, a war every decade in our part of the world, 48, 56, 67, uh, 73, 81, 91, I mean, it, you here are suffering from one major crisis which may extend into something much worse and far more far reaching of what happens to Europe and NATO. What do we have to ask ourselves in other parts of the world? For example, when, I don't know what you think of Huntington's writings, but when he talks about the West and the rest, this is a product of 1945. What is the West and the rest? Are we not represented by our finest minds who have traveled to different parts of the world and made their significant contributions? I think that this kind of polarity has to be understood in the context of your own British Halford Mackinder, Halford Mackinder, 1908, who spoke of the world island, from the Baltics to the Black Sea, down those rivers that we hear about in the news today, the Dnieper and the Vistula and the Vilna and whatever, all the way down to Turkey. And let's not forget that every drop of drinking water we get is from Turkey in the Arab Middle East. Roosevelt, 1945, saying to the British, you take Iranian and Iraqi oil, and we'll have Saudi Arabian oil. So the world's island is that geopolitical rift valley between European and Asian. That is the West and the rest, divided over matter, over material, not over ethics. Yeah. I don't know quite what Western leaders mean when they talk about Western values anymore. So I think that a new discourse has to be attended to inclusively and not exclusively. 
as an ethical policy statement and not as a political statement. Thank you. I'm afraid there's more questions. Um, Sidi Hassan. Uh, the international community, whatever its belief systems, subscribes to an assumption that human beings are worthy of dignity and respect. What, why should we be respected? And is there a metaphysical underpinning of this assumption that we do need to understand? Well, I try to earn your confidence by exhibiting positive and negative energies. And I'm not proud of the fact that I exhibited negative energies by saying the problem is with someone else or somewhere else. Because that's not my style. But I want to say that in attaining confidence and grace, which is required to release some of our negative energies, these will in invariably be less burdened by some of the morbidly powerful forces from which we suffer if we can develop some form of spiritual and behavioral equilibrium. Then and only then can we stand a chance of restoring a concept of what might be called perceptional revisionism. I mean, I'll never forget Robert McNamara's book about the Vietnam War, where it became patently obvious that whereas McNamara in the early days of the war possibly thought that the real threat was China joining with the Vietnamese, it was only when he visited, he himself visited Vietnam, that he realized that there was a visceral hatred and antipathy between the Vietnamese and the Chinese, of which he did not know. So is it possible to say, I was wrong, I didn't get it right, I will try to make amends or put this into a context? Identity consolidation is what I'm talking about here. You know. It is essential in any prospect for such revisionism that we consolidate our own identity and when I say I, our own, why should it not be within the context of a universal identity? On parochial issues, I can't discuss much with you because you know much more about the parochial issues in your parish than I do, and vice versa. But on a scale of 10, on the major issues that this planet faces, man against man, man against nature, and man-made disasters, can we develop an ethic based on consolidating our identity as contributive, creative human be beings in an inclusivist manner, free from fear, free from threat. That outreach might usher in. I mean, here I am talking to you. You have uh, participants from all over the world. And the chickens would come home to roost for you and for me in terms of the outcomes of such a conversation. In cases where perceptions are constricted, monoliths, dismissive and harsh, Let us hope that people can catch up, catch up with these cycles of hatred by starting to realize the extent to which they had harbored large, 
unnecessary and redundant feelings. I think today's Pauleans will talk about the baggage of hatred and energies of exclusion and fear. We have to free ourselves of all of this if we are to move to Odela, as the French would say, in Jerusalem, for example, Odela, that we are above the day-to-day killing and maiming, that we are interested in sharing in a belief in truth. Everyone says sovereignty in Jerusalem is God's. Well, how do we share in one God if we are going to continue to exercise politics in the manner that to which we have made ourselves accustomed. I, I would like to say again and again to you, because we have as emphasized education, that formal education is essential in any quest aimed at fostering better interfaith relations, interspiritual relations, interhuman relations, by replacing inaccurate information with accurate knowledge, as well as the minimization of ignorance. So we have to give due weight to the psychological component of education. And in that, I just want to say that acrimonious cycles of blame and finger pointing don't do it. You mentioned that phrase, the baggage of hatred. And you know that is so true. We sow these seeds of hatred, not just recently, I mean, over centuries. And those seeds take hundreds of years uh, to get dispelled. Uh, uh, you said right at the beginning of your talk, how must we arrange our affairs on the planet to enable dignity of humankind. Are we, are we uh, by nature, which after all brought us to the point, the apex in nature in some ways, are we consigned to being constantly aggressive? Is that in our nature? Is it something that we can't get rid of? Or do you have hope that the cycle that we're in, where that hatred and aggression is constantly being reborn. Do you feel that that can be turned around somehow? And if so, how? Well, I I enjoy stories. Everybody enjoys stories, especially if they're well written. And in 1911, there was a story set in Georgia, I believe, called Ali and Nino. It was about a love affair, like all good stories set in the context of hatred. After all, Romeo and Juliet is another shining example in the Western Shakespearean world. And I think the pseudonym of the author was Korban Zahid. The world they, they, he described of Ali and Lino in 1911, before the world changed, the world went mad. We all went mad. Millions upon millions of people were killed. Was where it began to go wrong. Where power, crude power, whether in red fascism or blue fascism, resulted in the killing of untold innocents. And I would like to suggest that Maybe with so much violence on screens and every form of communication device, on novels which are written in the most morbid uh, context, that ideal circumstances are usually promoted in positive personal relationships and friendships. And the goodwill generated from all of this can function as the incentive. I mean, what brought me to talk to you other than goodwill? 
and you to talk to me as the incentive and the drive to use not one off, but sustainably. This is a process in which we have all been involved in our different ways, where one's newly acquired education. What's education? I mean, what, what we understand. I don't throw out what I learned 10 years ago and 20 years ago. I benefit from it in using what is contributed to a formative view of life in the context of the other and in the most innovative and constructive way I can. So I would suggest that maybe as with the University of Dignity, which goes over 50 countries in the world, we have man against nature, island people coming from islands that are disappearing as we speak. I mean, we talk about from humiliation to human dignity, how destructive is that? I can't imagine. And we have people who are, of course, continuously subjected to bullets and bombs. And at the same time, we have this climate change disaster looming over our heads. We have to develop a network of groupings of people recognize their religious, across their religious, ethnic, and cultural divides, that they have to embrace each other in friendship and amity. But can this work for entire communities? Or rather than the United Nations, are we not in need of a United Peoples? I have tried to suggest alternative scenarios by referring to perceptional formation and perceptional revisionism. And I would love to work with any of you who would like to take this further in the future. Thank you. Do we have time for another question? And what I'm trying to say is that merely knowing about the other is by no means guaranteed to create better feelings. So we have to dismantle in the process generationally ingrained negative attitudes. Yes. Yeah. We have a comment which ties in with that. I was told that whoever or whatever you meet in life, whether you love it, love them or hate it or them. They are not but aspects of yourself, for the heart embraces in knowledge and love all creation. Not a question, but a comment. Um, I agree and no. Sorry, I interrupted you. Please, I, I would just like to say that in her discussion of the challenges of religious diversity, Diana Eck, director of the Pluralism Project, and professor of comparative religion and Indian studies at Harvard University, highlighted dialogue as the first principle of genuine pluralism. Without dialogue, without dialectic, the diversity of religions, of religious traditions, of cultures and ethnic groups becomes an array of isolated encampments, each with a different flag. Meeting only occasionally for, for, for formalities or for battle. The Swamis, monks, rabbis, archbishops, and let us add sheikhs, ayatollahs, imams, and mullahs to her list. And it's terribly important that the list is comprehensive. You know, it's easier for me to talk to the Christians because they understand. No, it's easier to me to talk to the X, Y, and Z because they understand this isn't the point. You're invading the issue. We are all humanity. Mm -hmm. All of us are human beings, unless we want to be excluded from that definition. She suggests that these different groupings may meet for an interfaith prayer breakfast, but without real dialogue. They become simply icons of diversity, not instruments of relationship. 
And I would say that the loneliness imposed on all of us individually and collectively since the beginning of COVID have done enormous damage. We have to revive cultural affinity and amity if we are to clear our minds and our consciences. They say in our part of the world, the longest distance is not just from here to here, the heart, the mind to the heart, but back again, from the heart to the mind. Indeed. Yes. We haven't touched on the specific problem of today, the war in Ukraine. And there's a question here. If I can find it. Thank you for your wisdom. Before we end today, I would like your opinion on how the obvious shift toward authoritarianism in the world can be counteracted. Well, can it be counteracted? Should it be counteracted? Well, I'd like to combine the answer to this with a comment again on Ibn Arabi, because I've seen him flashing up on questions more than once. He sought truth with his heart. And then through his contemplations and lived values, he developed the doctrine of theology, mysticism, metaphysics contained in his book, The Meccan Revelations. As I've said earlier, likewise, if I may, I advocate for the state of complementarity which combines what is witnessable and what is existential. What we see every moment of the coverage of what's happening in the Ukraine, I humbly submit, is witnessable. But in terms of our belonging to the same human race, the demonization of the other, and I mean of peoples, is not going to lead us to an understanding of the human dimensions of all of this. And once again, I want to say that the assumption that somehow because you're Western, you're more civilized than the rest of the world is creating huge pain in many parts of the world. Have they forgotten Afghanistan? Have they forgotten Yemen? Have they forgotten Palestine? Have they forgotten even the Holocaust? I mean, I sent a message to Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem. I went to Auschwitz. I was accused by mullahs of insanity and uh, threatened with asylum by the more extreme. But I did this out of principle because I understood that the truth is the truth. I'm not talking about myself. I'm sorry. I, 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 I hate using the word I. Audhu billah min karimat ana. But you, you can never go far enough, it seems, to establish your bona fide for a conversation as a member of the shared humanity because the color of your skin differs or you were born in the wrong part of the world. So this leveling should be a part of the credo of the international community collectively condemning the causes of the war, the running of the events of this war, and the possibility, let's face it, of at any second, the purview of the war extending. And I, I don't know, but I mean, I do remember that years ago when the Bamiyan temples happened, a Japanese envoy was sent, and I remember knowing her well, and I said to her, what did you do? Did you sit with the Taliban? She said, I never got anywhere near them. Quite honestly, I was there because of Japanese money, and I said, did that help? And she said, no. We were ready, the pres former president of Turkey, uh, the uh, Sheikh of the Azhar, your humble servant, the Mufti of Bosnia, to go and talk to them and say, what you are doing is not in our name. Is there anybody who is ready to go and say to these different peoples in their respective capitals, what are 
you thinking about a few months down the road? They say a war of attrition now. What attrition? The attrition of the world's resources, the world's livelihood, the world's existential needs, grain, food grain, for example. So I would, I, would, I, I would humbly suggest that the visits of individuals without a, a vision of peace and individuals with only a vision of war is sending mixed messages. When we had another conversation, <clears throat> you mentioned the word when I asked you about the place of mankind in this world. You mentioned the word stewardship, and I, I wondered whether you could expand on that in terms of... Well, I, noticed in one of the, I noticed in one of the uh, comments of our listeners that um, I only quote, religion is, comes from the Latin word ligare, mm. establishing a, a legal connection between people and this organizing principle. How, how what do I think... Uh, the question goes on to say, uh, anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm not catching it, that love should organize our... Is, is that, am I getting it correctly? I would just like to say that in terms of... Uh, I'm not here to promote religion per se. I'm here to promote good faith between us. I'm here to promote a code of ethics. So I mean, I, I am a devotee of Rumi. I am a devotee of Ibnology. And I re realize the value of the statements made by Al-Ghazali in his doubts about the logic of truth. Because if we look today at everything I have said and everything I, li I have lived, I have to admit that I have logic doubts about the logic of truth. I have with me this old book, Black Athena, if you, any of you remember it, by Martin Bernal, in which he talks about the Afro-Asiatic roots of classical civilization. The Afro-Asiatic roots of classical civilization. An Israeli Jewish professor came and said to me some years ago, we want to thank you for what you did for us in the 13th century or the 11th century. And I said, well, that's a bit before my time. But what did we do? We translated the classics in conjunction with all sorts of people, Jews, Persians. And as for this, I mean, if the classical civilization has to find its a reversal in its very being, to admit that it might have been affected by Afro-Asiatic roots, it's not a question of a, a, a conflict between us and them. Do we mean what we say about humanity or do we not? So, you know, in Greece, the sciences made rapid progress and achieved a very high degree of improvement. If the Egyptians were the inventors, this proved them to be ingenious. But the Greeks showed themselves to possess superior genius. Now, what is superior genius? And you go on to ask yourself, arts and sciences have been known to the Chinese for ages. You know, it, 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 this presentation of, of history as only favoring the powerful is very difficult, I think, and must somehow be rationalized. It would be far more interesting than continuing to show our differences and our disagreements over our differences to emphasize points of convergence and congruence. Sorry, yes. We've got an interesting um, note from Nick to everyone, which I'd like to read out to you. It's on the chat. Amongst many things, two words really caught my ear during HRH's speech and they were cleverness and wisdom. The word cleverness reminds of a Rumi quote, which I love. Sell cleverness to buy bewilderment or bewilderment, bewilderment. To me, cleverness is mind and bewilderment is intuition. So heart or heart-centered. What comes through from this perhaps apt for these times is sell cleverness to buy wisdom. Cleverness representing 
the individual mind rooted in duality and wisdom. Uh, sorry, in duality and wisdom, if it's clean and pure, therefore universal, coming from the heart, rooted in unity. The juxtaposition the of these two is interesting. On the basis of that, I would like to thank my contemporary at Oxford, Karen Armstrong, and to wish her well uh, for the amazing work that she has done on the principle of compassion which lies at the heart of all ethical and spiritual traditions. I think compassion also flows from wisdom and not from cleverness. Cleverness is too quick for us. Sadly, our time, I think, is up. And I would like to first thank the Bashara Trust for giving us this opportunity. And I wish you, the Trust, at least another half century of giving people like me the opportunity of finding a safe pilgrimage. Your Royal Highness, you've given us plenty to think about. From oracle to grave, there always seems to be more warmongers than peacemakers. But peacemakers like you shine a light in the darkness and give us hope. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all, my friend. Thank you, Bishara. Thank you.